it has um, Down syndrome or special needs in general. Um, from a very large standpoint, I think what you need to just first think about is how does this individual react to being sick? Just standard. Are they somebody that is generally gets sick a lot? Or when they have a cold, it just rocks their world more than, you know, the average person? Um, or are they an individual that really doesn't say any or, or describe any symptoms until it's like you feel their head and they've got 103 temperature? These are things that you need to be aware of. of this is going to be able to be the framework of everything moving forward there. And so always take in context how we've responded to in the past, both in sickness, but also more importantly is respiratory illness. So when they've had the cold, um, have they had maybe the flu? Those are gonna be really key indicators uh, that you're gonna need uh, moving forward um, to be able to reflect and, and identify. Uh, is, this, is this something that you, you know, need to act on more? Is there something that you need to do beyond just general supportive care? Um, we do know that individuals with Down syndrome are more prone to respiratory infections. Um, that, that's well known. Now, on the large scale, um, when we talk about COVID-19, it really is isolating is, is the high risk individuals. You know, we all probably have a story of that 20 year old that, you know, is on the ventilator. Those are the unique ones. They are not the standard. So at the largest scale here, vast majority, it's older age and high risk um, comorbidities. So the question really is, is, is down, having Down syndrome considered that? Or is that considered high risk? I wouldn't say that that's, and I, I am saying, it wouldn't on its own be considered high risk. The fact is, is that individuals with Down syndrome, more often than the general population, have those comorbidities that put them in the high risk category. And so that's important. So just having Down syndrome, you know, if your kid, you know, is 10 years old, otherwise healthy, nothing else really going on, no history of, that is not what I would consider high risk. Um, but really it's, it's some of the additional comorbidities that are often found in these individuals that you need to be taken in context. So heart disease. So that could be congenital or anything that has gone beyond that. So even, you know, individuals that had early on uh, issues uh, even if it was surgically repaired or just closely monitored there, congenital heart or is the same as any type of heart issue, I would say, from a high risk category. Asthma, um, I would say what is very common, whether it has been formally diagnosed or not, which I would say would be the only thing that would group down, individuals with Down syndrome in generally in a high risk category, is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is so, so common in individuals with Down syndrome, whether it has been truly formally diagnosed or not. Um, and so that could be something that would be thought of as an assumption to put them in that high risk category. And I'll explain, you know, how to utilize that in, in a minute. Um, of course, diabetes, but the other is group home. Um, if your individual that you're uh, with Down syndrome is living in a group home or a nursing home, that is high risk. Um, and, and so that is all considered it. Um, when it comes to um, individuals with sleep apnea, the, I do want to touch upon is if they're using a CPAP machine or a BiPAP machine. Um, BiPAP or CPAP is the concern is, is that for people who have contracted COVID-19 is that it potentially can aerosolize, meaning that it, it, it just spreads it all within the room and is just going to add to the, kind of the, the risk for all individuals around them. Um, if they start showing any symptoms of COVID-19, whether it's something really extreme or not, what I would recommend is talking to your doctor who is in charge of that and ask them if they should be taking a pause from using their CPAP or BiPAP. Um, and, and so that is just, these are all theoretic but it is a point of conversation within the ENT community. And I would um, uh, just kind of consider that um, where you're there. Um, when um, understanding any communication deficit that your individual has, 
And this is again, knowing how they are at baseline. Are they typically able to clearly express their symptoms? Are they historically able to tell you when they're not feeling well and actually say what's not feeling well? Or is it one of those that you find and identify there? Um, if it is a, if there's historically a very asymmetric, uh, as if, if your individual typically does not complain, does not describe their own symptoms, the second the symptoms would come, I would call the doctor because you could safely assume that that infection has been brewing for some time and you want that to be made aware right away. I'm not meant to scare anyone, but you could assume that, you know, several days probably beforehand where you and I might communicate where we're not starting to feel well and we'll have, you know, this kind of climb up to, you know, the more extreme symptoms, you might be skipping that whole first part and just be already there. So take that into consideration. Um, also, if your individual is suffering from Alzheimer's or early dementia, um, confusion or worsening confusion is going to be your answer. Um, that is by far well understood um, that if there's any increased risk, uh, I mean, if there's any increase in confusion or just not acting in their normal way, that should be your first red flag. Um, so what are my general recommendations? Um, I think same as what you guys are hearing already. I mean, social distancing, whether or not you want to wear a mask, I, I think those are standard. What I think is the single most important thing that needs to be identified is your plan, your plan of action. Okay. So there's two parts to this plan that you need to understand is one, what happens if the caregiver gets sick? What is the situation? Are there multiple individuals that could come in in that process to help out or not? If, if that caregiver is, you know, let's say the parent, um, is what's the isolation plan? Um, if they're the only caregiver, is there someone that you know that can help out and take over? Um, and if not, you know, contacting resources you have available, whether it's um, your local agency or state um, developmental disability agency, which is probably inundated, using resources like your uh, local Down syndrome community and, and, and support for that, I think are all very important. But one, the plan for the caregiver. But the more important is the plan for the individual with Down syndrome. And what I would say is, number one, identify those, you know, are they the individual that's gonna communicate early on? And how do they usually respond to illness, especially respiratory illness? Number two, always call your primary doc right away. Give them a heads up. Um, let them first have that conversation about, is there a test necessary? Are they considered high risk? If they have any of those extra symptoms, any of those comorbidities, they're high risk, enough said. Um, you can make the argument that the risk for sleep apnea, whether diagnosed or not, is there to put them in that high risk category. I would be amazed today that they would not allow or offer a test. Last week, two weeks ago, different story. Tests are a lot more readily available. I could speak on behalf of Indianapolis or in this area there, if your primary doc is not offering and it does make sense, it's appropriate there, contact me. Um, having an isolation plan. Um, the most important thing you need to do it's planned for if you have to go to the emergency room, okay? I would call your, the hospital that you would most likely go to, contact them, find out what their policy is with visit, visitors. I will say that traditionally, they're probably not gonna have a standard policy in store right now. Um, what they will likely do is say it will be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Your individual with Down syndrome is like a pediatric patient. Pediatric patients are allowed to have one person with them. What you need to find out is who is that person you need to contact to have that conversation for the case-by-case -case basis. So all this is planned out. God forbid you have to go to the emergency room. You already have your plan of action of if they won't, if they're gonna give me a problem staying, this is who I'm gonna talk to, all right? Um, and I can say that I could help out uh, much with um, St. Vincent system. I, um, you know, IU and community is um, 
I, I, while I, I go to community, I wouldn't say that I would have uh, the ability to help out as much. Um, but I do recommend don't you know, use that as much as having that plan of action for yourself. Contact them already. Know how the process is going to go. And also, even let's say they say, okay, yeah, no, normally we allow an, uh, you know, uh, a family member or, or whoever to come with an individual um, if they had to be admitted. Still find out who your contact person is because in the middle of the night, that ER doctor or that ER nurse may or may not know that. Um, you want to have your point of contact, okay? Um, so I think that that's um, very, very important. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that I truly want to say. Um, um, the one of the questions that I was um, asked early on before we kind of break up to open ones there is um, what to do when we're over the hump or before the vaccine. Um, if your individual did not, if, as far as you know, no one was exposed to COVID-19, we think that we've never had any exposure. Do we limit our socialization? What about if we're doing going to work, school, that's what? That's a great question that all of us are wondering for everyone, um, what to do in that situation. What is gonna be the standard is right now, the tests that everyone knows about are, do you have COVID-19 or not? What is starting to be discussed, and there's only one currently FDA approved, but it is gonna be the next big thing, is gonna be the serology test. It's the titer, it's the, have you had COVID-19 and now immune? So that is gonna be a huge factor for everybody as we get uh, the other side of the hump um, to determine entering back into the workforce. Equally as important for our individuals with Down syndrome. Um, what I would say is going back to thinking about, should you isolate them? Should you, you know, keep them from all these other, are they still high risk? Are they in that same high risk category that we talked about before or not? If they're not, they should be, you should be able to feel comfortable with them as it is for anybody else in this situation. Um, but take that, you know, I think on a um, very unique case by case situation. But in general, the main factor that is we are all going to be waiting for is the ability to identify those who have been already had it and 25% could, you know, had no symptoms and had it um, and recovered and have immunity. Um, in this time period before we get the vaccine. Um, now um, I will open up to any questions whatsoever, um, as specific as you like, um, you know, we're here for you. And I'll let Lisa kind of uh, moderator take that one over. Okay. Well, Josh, thank you. I do, there were a couple questions that were emailed to me um, this morning. And so I do want to just kind of um, go through that. Plus there was one in the chat, is thyroid either underactive or overactive considered to be like to cause a high risk category? Yeah, good question. Cause we know thyroid, um, problems in general runs very high in individuals with Down syndrome, especially as we get into the older age. No, I would not. Um, appropriately controlled thyroid um, with um, either if it's low and you're receiving extra, you know, uh, Synthroid or, or, or thyroid replacement and you're at a happy, you know, spot with your doc normally, um, and even slightly overactive, um, it is not considered high risk. Obviously, a significantly overactive thyroid is not good on any basis, whether we're dealing with COVID-19 or not. Um, so that's a conversation you should still be having with your primary, but what is more common is the hypothyroid, I imagine here. Um, and as long as you are normally at your baseline, that would not be considered high risk. Great, thank you. Okay, I think one, um, one big question on everyone's mind is, um, and it was just put in chat, are neurotypical individuals going to be given priority for ventilators? Or how do you see that kind of playing out? So for, and I know that this was passed on to uh, some of you that are out of state. So I could speak a lot for in-state right now. 
Right now, we have more than enough ventilators in our state um, for what is proposed as the likely surge that we're going to need there. So I do not believe that we're going to be in any situation even close um, to what um, we're seeing in some of the more, um, you know, New York and, and such places on the sense of lack. That's the importance of you being able or whoever to be bedside. You need an advocate there. If you have an advocate, I mean, no, there is, there is not going to be part of the, the protocols that everyone has been reading about in different locations and how you're going to deal with these life decisions there. None of them have uh, a, a section for kids with disabilities. All right. But we know that it's going to be in the mind. I mean, let's not kid ourselves, unfortunately. That, that's just how it is. Having an advocate next to you at the bed, being a family member, one of you there is very important. So if you are sick yourself, find somebody else. Somebody needs to be next to the bed. That being said, for the state of Indiana, there is no thought right now that we're going to have a shortage um, and, and be in that situation. But we should always plan, just like I was saying, plan, 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 have an advocate next to the bed. And again, you know your point person who is your hospital physician advocate because you're going to be calling anyways and figuring out who that person is because that you'll know to be able to get this, that's going to be the same person in these situations. All right. So, you know, they're, they're everywhere and they are everywhere right now because there's ethical issues out the wazoo going on um, because of all these, these situations. Um, but this would really, if it would ever happen, would be in the surge, being in effect when we hit our peak here. And for Indiana, um, you know, that's expected to be within the next couple of weeks and a month. Um, early May, um, but have your point person, have someone bedside there, but all in all to kind of put people at ease there, we are not expecting there to be an issue in Indiana with ventilators. We actually did not give ours, New York wanted them and Holcomb actually made a point to say that unfortunately he wasn't offering them um, for that exact reason. Thank you. Okay, I think most of the questions that were emailed in were answered. You had touched on sleep apnea and um, using a CPAP. So what about sleep apnea treated with oxygen via nasal cannula? cannula? So if it's high flow, and, and high flow is, is going to be very variable depending on if we're talking about more of a kid versus an adult. High flow um, nasal cannula uh, plus four plus liters there would be considered in a higher risk category of aerosolizing. That being said, unless they're having symptoms that are leading you along the path that we're suffering from COVID-19, I would still use it. Benefits outweigh the risk. The second those symptoms come up, you're going to be calling your doctor anyway. It's like we talked about there. That should be on the list of questions to ask, should we pause? If there, for some reason you forget, whatever, I'm telling you, just stop them. Just stop using it um, because, you know, having a poor night of sleep is much less um, of an issue than that potential of aerosolizing. And again, this is still theoretic, the concept of aerosolizing, but if the having a couple of nights without your um, supplemental oxygen is, is not the end of the world, but that being said, um, that should be on your list of questions to the primary doc when you're calling them and that, when symptoms arise anyway. Okay. Would a nebulizer aerosolize the virus in the same way as a CPAP? Yeah, we're not, a lot, we're not doing nebs in the hospital at all um, for that exact reason. Um, what I will say to get back at our, our sleep apnea in gen and in general, um, if we start having symptoms, um, if you want ahead of time, or you can think about getting a finger pulse ox um, is going to be helpful for you. Don't use it as your safeguard because without getting too complicated, depending on the, how the body responds to this, it could be deceiving, but you could use it as at least not as a we're good, but more of we're bad. Um, so don't be overly reassured if your individual is struggling, you know, respiratory wise, but their finger stats are looking good, don't be deceived by that. But if you're noticing that they're kind of, you know, really not communicative with you, you know, things like that, 
Um, generally, this is how they are when they're sick. That's where a pulse ox, if your oxygen levels are starting to go down, would be of help. So that's, I think, if you're going to add anything to your thermometer, um, that would be the only other thing I would consider um, having around, especially um, if you are uh, individual that you're caring for, uh, typically is uh, non as verbal in these situations. Thank you. And if any of you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat section. Um, I'm just kind of pulling the questions from there. And we got through them all. So I'm sure there are more out there. Um, I think um, the other thing that I would say is really important for just things to be do making sure you're aware of having your plan, social distance, stuff like that, is um, doing the best you can to decrease the stress in the house. I know that's a lot easier said than done. I've got a four and a two year old. You know, it's more stressful at home than it is for me at work right now. But that being said, um, you know, whatever that is for your individual, be cognizant of how you're reacting. Um, increased stress is going to affect our the entire our, just our the way our body reacts to things. And so, if you could do almost anything just to be cognizant of, is um, just trying to keep the stress down as much for everyone there, um, keeping things as normal um, for you guys as you can from a routine perspective, sleep, um, you know, all of that uh, I think is important uh, in these situations. Excellent. So would Crohn's disease be considered high risk? So autoimmune, um, I would say is I would be in an individual with Down syndrome, yes, I would. Um, you know, I think in the average um, population, well-controlled Crohn's disease, um, you might can say that they're slightly more immunocompromised. If, if you are taking medication that makes you immunocompromised, then 100%. Um, but if you're not in the average person, no, I would say an individual with Down syndrome, that would, I, that would be enough for me. But I, I truly believe at this stage in the game, with how readily tests are starting to become available, um, especially over the next week or so, um, I don't think it's going to be as ch challenging to be able to um, convince or have that conversation with your primary care doc about getting a test done on your individual Down. Maybe not for you, but for our individuals uh, that we're caring for with Down syndrome or of any type of disability, I, you know, I, I would imagine that it shouldn't be as, that difficult right now. Okay. So um, my next one is gonna be kind of two parts. If your child doesn't usually run fevers when sick, would we still expect a fever with COVID-19? And do you have a recommendation on using ibuprofen versus Tylenol to treat a fever? Two very, very good questions. Um, as we kind of started the whole thing off, know your individual adult kid, you know, know how they are and how they are typically. If they don't have a fever, yeah, it, they can. But for them, don't expect maybe them to have a fever. Um, it's not if they don't have a fever, they don't have COVID-19, all of us have it. No. We know that there's a wide variety of presentations. We know certain symptoms and things are more common than others, but there's a very wide range. If this is some way that they normally react, go 100% off of that. So that's why I think it's one of the most important things other than making the plan is really reflecting on the, your specific, uh, you know, uh, loved one and how they typically are in these situations, how they typically react in this type of situation. Because it's just like, you know, a parent intuition, you know, you know better than anybody else. You know, this is how they normally respond. COVID-19 is not going to give us, you know, um, a situation where we have symptoms that we've never seen before, you know, like Ebola or smallpox. It's going to give symptoms that we've seen in other issues. It's just harder to fight, often or worse, and it just has different implications. But the way that they react, the symptoms they give, and how they respond shouldn't be any different in, in this situation. Um, 
second question, ibuprofen and Tylenol. There has been no legitimate study that says ibuprofen is worse. Um, if your kiddo or family member, loved one responds better to ibuprofen than Tylenol, I would be fine giving ibuprofen. If they typically from a fever or headache or whatever, respond equally as well between the two, just stick with Tylenol. Um, but I would not be afraid of, of ibuprofen. Uh, there's, there's not even remotely enough credible information out there um, to make a strong you know, statement on that one. Thank you. And would having a heart condition put one in a high risk category? Yeah, I think I saw, I was seeing on the chat, Wolf Parkinson White for sure. Any, any heart condition in an in individual with Down syndrome or in general at this point, but 100%, yes, that would be high risk. Okay. And what about not having a spleen? Would that put you at high risk? Splenectomy, no, I'm not, as, it's been a while, and I don't know what my general surgeon colleagues would say. This, splenectomy is kind of like a bigger version of a tonsillectomy. It has a lymphatic purpose there, but it's not like when people have a splenectomy that we would put them traditionally in immunocompromised state. Um, use it if you want to. You know, if, if you have an individual that had a splenectomy, um, I would not say you are, should be more afraid for them to get it because of being immunocompromised, what I would say is you could utilize that to convince your primary doctor they're in the high risk category if you need to get a test. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to, I have a question that was emailed in. So we have an individual. Um, his son is four years old. He's had heart surgery. There's a leak and he needs to do heart surgery or have surgery again. So what can he do? I guess the question to prevent um, COVID-19 possibly just to kind of take the best care of his little guy that he can. Yeah. So, you know, if we're talking about, if you're still, if you're supposed to have surgery during this time period, you know, that's going to be at your surgeon's um, discretion on, you know, is this, elective or not. And so that, that, you know, is a conversation there. I will say that if you have to be admitted to a, a pediatric hospital, it's probably the best place to be admitted right now versus a regular adult hospital, because if they have any individuals with COVID-19, it would be a very, very small percentage. And those patients are probably very well isolated right now. Um, if you're talking about um, just in general, um, social isolation, it's going to be your best bet for, you know, and, and it's just social distancing, just, you know, and just doubling down on that, um, being just very cognizant of that, washing your hands, washing your hands, washing your hands, um, and then just kind of waiting like the rest of us on what the next step is going to be once we're on the other side of the hump. Um, but I think that um, there's nothing probably more than other than just really just sticking to guidelines as strongly as you can, um, you know, w would be your best bet. I know there's a question. Sorry, I just wanted to message Sebastian. I just sent your message too. Um, do you recommend a cool mist humidifier in the house or used in a child's room at night just to help? So I'm a huge believer of, of humidification and moisture in general, especially if we're a little bit under the weather. If, if you're talking about at baseline, I mean, if that's, if that's how you kind of have your normal night routine, I think that's perfectly fine. If you are doing it in response to them getting junky up here, possibly we're talking about the infection, no. Um, you're just adding pretty much a platform for that virus to sit on and kind of fly around the room. Um, but in general, whenever anyone is congested, I 100% typically would say, I'm a huge believer of cold mist uh, uh, humidification, but if this is, to help relieve symptoms of being congested or um, being under the weather right now, I would not. Thank you. Would taking Humira and Cosyntex lower your immunity? 
Yeah, um, you know, I, I definitely would put that in the immunocompromised, um, you know, uh, state from there. Um, you know, it's that that is always one of those important things that um, to have that close conversation with your doc. I definitely don't recommend suspending it unless, you know, that's the conversation you have with them. But in that situation, that would be considered high risk. Thank you. Okay, do you recommend any supplements, vitamins, homeopathic or preventive measures? Um, in general, uh, no more than you normally, I, I would say would. Um, it's interesting, there's some, in it, and I don't want it to be taken as like, oh, but let's go rush the, the GNC. Um, zinc and vitamin um, C are you know, hot topics right now. Um, and part of treatment. Um, I would not be doubling down on that right now by any means. Um, there's definitely not enough information, but when we talk about treatment protocols that are being utilized both in the United States and over in Europe, if we have anything that includes vitamins, those are the two vitamins that are uh, being played into. Um, definitely, and we're talking about higher dosages than you should ever be talking about, so don't. Um, Stick with what your normal routine is. Adding anything right now is not going to probably change it. Um, actually, I could tell you it's not going to change it. Um, but do know that um, the role of some of this is being thought of, but would be at a therapeutic level, uh, a point that you should not be um, considering right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to read this question. So my son uses a nebulizer multiple times a day for chronic lung disease. What should I do if he starts showing symptoms, discontinue the nebulizer, but I worry that would make it worse for him since those meds are specifically to keep every little virus from becoming pneumonia. So those are, these are the tough ones. What I would say, number one, definitely talk to your doc, 100%. If you start showing any symptoms for in that situation, you should be talking to your doc number one is because you're at a much higher risk at baseline because of your whatever's underlying from the lung perspective. And number two is let them have that conversation with you. What I'm speaking for is um, on an average basis, um, what the thought is, just like CPAP that I've talked about and just NEBS in general, these are conversations that are being had out there, I still recommend you every single time talking to your doctor before you would change anything. But in this specific question, you know, the NEBS are obviously one, very important, but two, represent actually the underlying issue that's going on, which is very important. So if there is even the lick of symptoms, I would be contacting your pulmonologist, I imagine at that point, if you have, if you're using one or whoever um, is the, you know, a managing those medications for you, um, because I would have a very low threshold to come in um, and be seen. Because the, the, the transition when it gets to a respiratory problem is fast. Um, and so that's why I think it's so important that you know your individual and how they typically respond, because you're, you, you know, by the if you if sometimes we're waiting until they bring it up and if historically, by the time they brought it up to you, it's probably been brewing for several days. This is going to be no different. Once you get to that, if you get to that respiratory spot there, that's where things potentially can go and go fast. So what I would do is be very cognizant, whether we're talking about the individual in the specific question or, or in general. Um, if you get to the respiratory spot, if you have not already strongly spoken to your doc, do so. Um, what I would say is that when you maybe get those first symptoms that you're imagining, like fever or something else before we get to that point, um, going over the plan with them, doc, you know, we have a CPAP or we do NEBS, what should we do here? Okay, doc, um, what are the symptoms? If this is happening in the middle of the night, should I just be taking my kid or my loved one to the emergency room? Reiterating this plan with them um, because now, you know your individual the best, but from a medical standpoint, that doctor knows them the best in general. And so putting those minds together, getting that plan together, having those specific scenarios 
mentally played out um, and having those trigger points to go to escalate to the next point, uh, next point being, you know, emergency room, such like that, um, having already know so that you don't think about it. You don't let emotions get in the way of it. You just know we've came to the decision that if this X situation happens or this symptom shows up, we are going to do this so that it's just right away a uh, reflex there because, you know, at, at times where you're starting to get worked up, like any of us there, sometimes it's hard to think 100% clearly and, and there's some hesitation and then um, you're, you're not sure if you're overreacting and things like that. Have these thoughts and plans in place so that God forbid anything happens there, it's autopilot. So, sorry, just to sum up. So you're saying that we should give our primary doctor or pediatrician a call and just talk through this with them or the nurse? At the, at the, at the beginning of any symptoms, um, mm -hmm. not, not just right now, have a plan of action. What I want you guys to do is have a plan of action. If, a, if the caregiver has potential infection, how we're gonna manage that, all right? But mm -hmm. also, you know, the plan of action that can be made right now is, what would your home isolation plan be? What is your kiddo or loved one and how do they respond typically, you know, in um, illness, specifically respiratory? What is your hospital that you're planning potentially go to policy on having somebody with your loved one? And no matter what, who is your point person on that? Or who is your advocate? And then the fourth would be is, you know, when you call your primary doc, I want to address these plan of actions, but I'm going to only call when I have symptoms that I'm concerned for COVID-19. But when I call, I know already that, you know, little Johnny is taking NEBS and, you know, we want to know about that, or he's on his CPAP or know about that, or, you know, just a reminder, a doc, you know, he has this heart thing there, you know, is this something we should just get tested right now? Having your questions ahead of time is, is going to be important. So again, having your plan for the caregiver isolation or if they're infected, having an individual plan for your um, loved one with uh, Down syndrome, and then within that plan, what's a home isolation plan? What are the symptoms or what are the kind of the typical presentation of illness in that individual? Um, if I go to the emergency room or the hospital, you know, who's my point person? And if, you know, I'm eventually call my primary doc there, these are the questions that I need to make sure are addressed. Thank you for that clarification. Sorry. Um, next question. I heard on the news that obesity may be a contributing factor to severe reactions with Down syndrome obesity rates. Do you think that there's a correlation between obesity and COVID-19, is that accurate? You should look at obesity as not, it's, it's the risk, it's what's giving you is likely sleep apnea. And the sleep apnea is where the risk is. Sleep apnea puts you at a higher risk for respiratory illness in general, um, but it also creates your airway to be slightly more reactive. You traditionally, if you're not treating it, um, with anything, you're saturating lower at baseline or you're having moments in the evening that you are going to saturate, your oxygen levels are going to drop, add a little bit of, you know, uh, you know, problems that the virus brings you, it could bring you down to a level that's not safe. Um, so no, in essence, obesity itself is not, we know that individuals with, the diet, uh, with Down syndrome suffer from obesity, but in, in addition, you know, hypotonia, um, hypothyroid, all these other factors, but obesity would be one of those that would be likely to be giving a um, obstructive sleep apnea situation or picture, and it's the obstructive sleep apnea that would be something that would put them in a higher risk. Okay. Um, then I'm going to kind of circle back to one of the questions that was emailed in that I forwarded over, but Let's say that an individual with Down syndrome is in another country that has a low rate of cases currently, like Argentina. What are your thoughts on that? Like, are we still want to practice social isolation? Like, what, what are your thoughts? 
So I'm sorry, Claire. So is, is the individual is in Argentina or they're here? Like, what should they be doing in Argentina? I guess is the question. Yeah. Do you mind, Sebastian? Can I unmute you? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. How are you? you? I feel like I'm just butchering his question. So <laughs> I'm gonna let him ask it. Yeah, hi, hi. Um, thank you very much. We are uh, living now in Argentina and um, I have a son, four years old. And uh, well, he, he has um, a heart problem and um, we, we're really afraid about that. And uh, I really, I, I don't know how to take care. Um, well, here uh, we have very, very low cases of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we have not so much. So um, we are in quarantine now, uh, just like uh, already 30 days. But um, we, um, I'm taking care of very well for my son. So um, uh, but the question is, if, if you can recommend something special for him, uh, because we, we're really afraid about the, his uh, heart problem. Yeah, so what I would say now, and, and I'm not as um, well up on, you know, what the specific index is in, in Argentina. Now, are, is it the country is having you guys go into isolation or you guys just individually have made that choice? No, no, dog. The, the, the complete country is in quarantine. Okay, yeah. So what I would say is if, if they're already being that proactive, they're not going to release you guys from isolation until they believe the threat is you know, uh, small. So I, I mean, you know, you got to play what you're comfortable with, but I would imagine that if they are taking such a strong, bold move like that, that they're not going to release that, uh, you know, isolation uh, mandate until they're at a point where they, from a health perspective, um, believe that the concern or the risk to the population is low. So, um, you know, I, I personally would feel comfortable um, if, they release it and are comfortable with everyone going around, you should feel some essence of safety with that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about the vaccine and its importance? You know, Right now, it's when we're going to get a vaccine. Um, it's going to be equally as important um, in the future, um, I believe, as you know, things like flu shot um, or going to be part of it. But um, right now, it's very important. I mean, because we just don't know how any individual is going to react. We have people that are 25%, we're believing right now, had no symptoms at all and big carrier. Um, then we have, you know, mortalities. I have, a, unfortunately, a, a healthy 40-year-old down my street who um, had it and had a stroke. Um, why? We don't know. There's so very little we do know um, that something like a vaccine is going to be very important um, because uh, that threat is out there. Unfortunately, I think that there is a potential that there's going to have to be some level of guarantee um and this is going to be a hot topic when it happens i think but there's talks about um to fully go back into day to day that there's gonna you know have to be some showing that you've either been infected and you're immune right now or that you've taken certain actions potentially like to get a vaccine and that um something from a public health standpoint um but the vaccine i think is going to be very very important because if this is anything like the flu from 1918 unfortunately the first round of it being december of 1918 was minuscule compared to what december of 1919 was when 85 percent of all the mortality actually happened um so it's that's why if you listen to a lot of the talks um especially you know dr fauci and such there um there's no question that there's going to be a reawakening of this potentially in the winter. And what their goal is for the vaccine is for that. 
it's not going to answer be the solution to what we have currently going on here. It's going to be to try to cut off this, the, the resurgence of it um, a year from now. Thank you. So next question is, what are your thoughts on the mother of a five-year-old with Down syndrome who is a nurse? and working on the front lines. How risky is that coming home to him every day? Um, I think in, in general, one, you, know, you have to take into account um, risk factors for your five-year-old. Um, do they have any of those comorbidities? Um, we know very well, um, or not very well, we have a lot of good data that has come out of Europe. China was not the case, but Europe and both United States um, of the rates of infections requiring hospitalizations and mortalities of pediatric patients in general. There has been nothing remotely reported that is putting a higher risk of an individual with Down syndrome that did not carry another comorbidity with it. There's just having Down syndrome. And we already know that the risk for kids, God, you know, which is the greatest thing about this, if there is a good sign, um, is that its risk for kids are very low. Um, so that needs to be taken into an account. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's a very personal decision. Um, I, you know, people on the front lines, whether you're nurse, doc, janitor, who it is, have gone on, on many different extremes. Some, you know, are going into isolation themselves in a hotel, in a tent. Some are just making sure they're very good about, you know, uh, when they're at work with their PPE, um, cleaning up right when they get home, things like that. So I think it's, I think it's, you need to think of it as, and again, this is assuming there's no other significant comorbidities, how you would be with your any kiddo that's five, Down syndrome or not. Um, because I don't think that that right now, you know, uh, because the risk is seen to be so low still, um, is just how you would be with any, you know, child of yours. Um, but that is a very kind of just personal, um, tough, tough question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, does having had tonsil and adenoid removal surgery increase the risk um, for symptoms or prognosis? Like, would that put you at a higher risk? No, this is one I can tell you with very strong confidence. This is like bread and butter for us here, there. Um, no, and actually, um, it would be the opposite direction. Um, if you, which often I would imagine the case, if you had your, the tonsils and adenoids taken out for sleep apnea, well, it, there is a still a not insignificant percentage of individuals that it doesn't cure for a large percentage. Um, it does that lowers your sleep apnea numbers and potentially risk, which then makes you in the less severe category. So it's actually more beneficial for those individuals. Um, Unspecified eating disorder, would that contribute at all? Um, it would be more from like a malnutrition standpoint. Um, okay. if, if you're suffering with issues of malnutrition, um, your ability to fight anything, you know, is, is going to be lower there. Um, so it, a disorder on its own, if they're maintaining weight in an appropriate way, um, I wouldn't put that probably there. But if you're dealing with malnutrition, um, it's it's going to affect you no matter what, just on your ability to um, you know have the energy or the the energy capacity within your system to fight. Thank you. Okay, are tests for sleep apnea still being scheduled during this time? My daughter is seven and has not yet been tested. So in in hospital or like inpatient sleep at the sleep tests without a doubt they're canceled um home sleep testing i i, I can't say 100 percent. that'd be a good question that you know contact or have whatever company your um doc might use to see if they are i would imagine that there'd be no reason unless they had to close down their offices that they wouldn't because you know it's done at your house that being said um the jury is isn't completely out on the utility of using the home sleep apnea test on pediatric patients. I think it's a very um, individual, it, it, it's to the opinion of either your ENT sleep doc pediatrician, if they even feel comfortable that that's uh, an associate there. But um, definitely 
inpatient sleep uh, studies, yeah, are canceled. Thank you. And to be honest with you, even if you got one, it wouldn't change anything because no one's going to be, even if you're sleep apt, if you're sleep apt, I imagine if it's absolutely horrendous, maybe, but most likely no one's going to take out tonsils and adenoids right now anyways. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you anticipate schools being closed for the fall semester? If not, would you consider it a good idea to homeschool my kids since my daughter with Down syndrome has prior heart surgery and frequent respiratory infections? Thoughts on that? Um, fall, I, I, I have no idea. I mean, I think that what we're finding out just in the last 24, 48 hours is we have no, as much as we think we understand what's really gonna be what's gonna happen tomorrow, we have no idea. Um, we adjust our projections and curves, you know, every 12 hours. Um, so fall, I, I think it, it, it's anyone's guess. Um, assuming that things are okay and school opens back up there. I mean, I think that that's a choice to be had. Um, I think no matter what, I imagine at that time there would be a antibody test definitely take that. I mean, because it could answer the whole thing for you. Your, your, your child might have been exposed and already recovered and you don't know. Um, the other thing is, is that if you know, schools haven't made their policy yet on what they're going to potentially require of students to come back. Um, if you know somehow that in your child's class, they're going to be with individuals that all have had it and can prove that they've had it there, then you know your risk is lower. Um, so I think that um, it's, a, it's a lot of unknown and it really is just kind of at your you know, personal basis. Also knowing where we are on the treatment side of things. Have we figured out a good treatment um, that, you know, so that we know if we get it, that we have a good answer there. So there's a lot of what if, there's gonna be a lot that we know at that point, um, but I think we're gonna have a lot more at our disposal that can play into answering that question for you. Um, so I think right now it, that's it's really hard to tell on, but we I do say with confidence that we will be able to have a lot more at play to f place into factors to help you make that decision easier than what it would be today if you had to make it. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna read the next one. I have a child that has had multiple neurosurgeries to correct AAOI, and I apologize. I'm sure you know what that means. I don't know what the abbreviation is, and I apologize to all of you who probably do. Um, cervical spine instability. One surgery was transoral, so she often gets chronic sinus infections. Would this make her high risk? Chronic science infections, um, no, um, and I, even the fixing the anal, uh, actual kind of instability itself, I, I wouldn't as well. Um, so uh, I would say that what you have to be aware of from the chronic science infection is knowing that there's a possibility that your kiddo is going to get sick, um, and it's going to be confusing to know is this their chronic science infection oh. or is, is this you know COVID nineteen? Um, always kind of shed on the side of potentially it's COVID-19 and call your primary doc because, you know, you guys could have that conversation. But in and of itself, I would not say that it puts you any more high risk, um, you know, for that perspective. Got it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we were at uh, 7.30. Is there anything else that you want to add? We have kind of um, questions. And... In general, you know, if, if you think of something, um, you could get hold of, uh, you know, Lisa, um, and she can pass those along there. Um, if you are having problems um, and need some extra help, um, you know, if I can't, you know, I probably know somebody that can. Um, so don't hesitate that. But I think the key is this plan. If you haven't already, get your plans down, get your resources in check, get your who is, you know, the important situated people there. Um, and just so 
God forbid, if anything happens, you already know what you're going to do. Um, it takes, you know, I think a lot of the stress out of it. Um, and it allows you at the time to put emotions as much as you can to the side, because you already said, this is what we agreed on, you know, in this situation there, or, you know, this is, you know, how, you know, our, I've already talked to the doc and he, you know, said, if this was it, that we do it and we're not overthinking this or we're not, you know, you're dramatizing it. So, um, have all that are there. And to be honest with you, you know, I'm not like a journaling person, I'm, you know, whatever, but I think that you will feel a little bit more in control of the situation if you do have your plan and stuff there. Um, and again, if there's any questions that you think of, um, pass it along to Lisa. I'm happy to answer. Unfortunately, my practice is pretty much ground to a halt, so I do have a lot of free time right now. Um, so I'd be happy to help out if uh, anything is needed there. Oh. I will say for St. Vincent, um, when it comes to caregiver policy, based off of all the, what I know, I know they do not have anything written there, but in all essence, um, it is viewed as a pediatric patient. But that being said, know what hospital you would be closest to, you know, not just in the organization, because unfortunately, going to IU Saxony or St. Vincent Anderson, and your point person is down, you know, in, in St. Vincent Indy or at Methodist, these, while you think they're connected, they're not connected um, by any essence there go to the hospital that you are going to think that you're going to be going, would go to, that you have a relationship with that is geographically closer to that situation. That's the people that you need to call and talk to and get that information from, because you would be amazed on how these institutions do, or just buildings don't talk to one another. Um, and so I have that there and, and having that, whoever that physician lays, liaison, that point person, that advocate specifically at their, if they are taking inpatient, if they're taking care of COVID-19 patients, they have those other resource individuals there as well. Um, so be sure to kind of find out, you know, who that person is. Thank you so much. And I just want to say a huge thank you um, to you for your time this evening and to all of you who joined our call. And I just want to say all of the staff at Down Syndrome Indiana think about you guys all the time and we worry about you and we look at your posts on social media and I know there's been just a lot of tension and nerve, right? We all feel that. And so in a brief, you know, interaction with Dr. Green, he was like, what can I do? Do you think this would be helpful? And I was like, oh my goodness, yes, absolutely. So just want to say he is the real deal, we're so <laughs> for his involvement in our organization. Um, obviously came from a great family. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, again, all of you for joining our call, even though we have such beautiful weather outside. And thank you for your time, Dr. Green, so. No, thank you and everyone, keep your head up. It, I'm telling you, we're on the on and up. Things are looking better today than they've had in a long time. Um, we're gonna get through this there and be better for it there. Um, just uh, get your, you know, everything in plan, enjoy your time with your loved one at home and uh, we'll be enjoying summer in uh, due time. Great, thank you. Have All right, everyone night. have a good night. Bye. Mm -hmm. That's a good night. Mm -hmm. Bye.